Hi there. Going on shortly in about uh, three minutes. And I just want to say happy Sunday. We're going to have a nice soulful Sunday talk. And I'll wait on all of you to bring your dinner, your wine, your juices, whatever it is that you fancy to join in this evening. Hi there, Sandra. Sandra, since you're my invited guest, I'm going to actually, hey Opal, I'm not going to put you on show yet, Sandra. I'm waiting on a few more people to join. Alicia, I'm calling it our soulful Sunday time connection. Yes. It is for us to have real talk and Sandra, I see your request to view in. Let me, let me add you from now while everybody else enters the space. Our faithful people are coming in. Hey, star. Oh, Lord have mercy. What did I do? Lord have mercy. Did I put you in? Sent a request. What am I supposed to do? Live with Sandra. Guys, I'm getting it for free. Everybody have to tell me what they're having for dinner. You know, Sandra is waiting to join in. <laughs> I'm hey, in. hey <laughs> we're waiting Hi. for everybody to join in. Hey, Opal. Hi, Dean Roper. I miss you. Don't know. Listen, I want to know what everybody has eaten for their Sunday dinner. Try drop it in the chat. <laughs> if you're happy to get it, Please let me know what you're having and what you're drinking. If you're drinking anything. Yes, Alicia says she's having, where does everybody get gungo from at this time of the year? She's having fish and gungo, rice and peas with, of course, carrot juice. She's on this juicing journey too. I want to know, what, Sandra, what did you have? Have you eaten anything? No, I, I have not had dinner yet. Okay. I'm still friend. at the office. Oh, wow. Thank you so much for accommodating us today. Okay. It's my pleasure. In show business, you don't eat until after the show. Just in case. Absolutely. <laughs> Maureen, where you get gunga rice and peas at this time? I thought that was only like at Christmas. No, I saw, I've seen a lot of gunga on the road. Have you? Yes. Wow, I had no idea. And she's all the way in Canada, so I don't even know where she get that Well, they sell it in a can too. That's true. That's true. Yes. Well, I know that we have a few people that have already joined. I want to thank you so much for your time. Marcia, you're here. David Roper says, no dinner yet, but he's probably going to have tomato soup and a grilled cheese sandwich. That sounds like soul food to me. I love that. I absolutely love roasted tomato soup. Drinking water, it's 36 degrees in Toronto. In anticipation of what will be a great evening. Hi, Debs. Welcome, welcome. So I'm going to actually be having a little bit of snapper later. And um, you have cake? Thank you. Thank you, Alicia. Alicia says that we look beautiful, vibrant colors. Oh, thank you. <laughs> These very big earrings, and instead of earrings, I do big necklaces. So I think we yes. complement each other. Marcia, you have nothing to eat this evening. What are you having, Marcia? Hey, Marcia, my namesake just joined. I don't know how long you're going to join on for, but this one is worth it. We all need to hear from Sandra. Trust me today. <laughs> all right, folks. In respect for your time, we're going to jump on, and it gives me great pleasure. I intentionally did not ask Sandra for a bio. My goal is to actually use this platform to just be at our purest, realest, unadulterated state and talk about life's journey. This platform is used to encourage, to empower and really equip us to live our best lives as God has intended for us to do. And Sandra is one, Sandra just happens to be one of those persons that is for me a lighthouse, a beacon of light, a woman who has been knocked down and get back up again. And hi, bestie BFFFF, Dion just joined in. Hi. Um, but Sandra has been quite the beacon of light for me. And 
she wouldn't even know how much of an impact that she has had on me over the years but i have seen her navigate this course called life and navigate it in a fashion that would afford us not to complain about aspects of our journey she has for sure been described in my books and by many as an overcomer she has battled the big c of cancer she has never accepted that she has done it alone she has always said god has brought her through she has had the walk of losing what could be considered losing a job a, a job that had a secure paycheck and um, and then yet still like an eagle she soared above that and understood the word pivot way before it became popular and especially now and so i'm inviting sandra to give us some of those nuggets one about the importance of how to overcome two about the importance of how to pivot and three her love for life is unequivocal like me no same love life many of you love life but she <laughs> love life like to a different level like our dog name if it just put it in perspective our dog name happy which is a represent representation of how sandra actually is so without any further ado before i even have sandra speak i want to thank all of you for joining it's sunday It should be a Sunday dinner time. Hey Samaria, hey Cheryl. I haven't taken this for granted. And guys, clap me no. Clap. Turn up and up. Drop the clap that in. Here's what you have to clap. This is now my This is now what the third one, the first one. I got my feet wet and Asia Simone was on with me. The second one, I took the leap and told you about my lupus journey and that hidden secret and love from that day light like a feather. You don't say I'm a looks slim and fabulous because <laughs> lose weight. I didn't know it was a sack I was carrying. Last week we spoke about the importance of self-worth over net worth and I really could not. I would have this one audience of one. I really would because I'm really doing what I believe God has put on my heart to do. and i had to also get out of my comfort zone and and act courageously so this is also an act of courage so this now is the fourth one and the fourth one has me introducing sandra samuel the ceo of totally male still the only such exclusive one here in jamaica and perhaps maybe even the caribbean but sandra can tell us more about that so sandra tell us about you. who are you anyway Well, so, well, first of all, thanks for having me, Marsha and I mean really and truly I am honored to be in your company and to be a part of your journey. So, who is Sandra Samuel? Sandra Samuel is a only child born to Joyce Marriott, 56 years old, have no problem saying that. Good. Very very happy little right and i am the owner and operator of the 25 year old totally mail the only business of its kind in the caribbean catering to the aesthetic upgrading of boys and men <laughs> all right we're not and, you know pretty much a happy individual spiritual love dancing love life as you said lover of life period that's who i am awesome 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 now that love of life which has always been a part of who you are yes. but you got knocked down sandra you yes. told well, the, 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 the yes. real well the love of life i had uh pretty much all my life but i became more deliberate post breast cancer I was diagnosed with breast cancer at the age of 35. Well, no, let me go back a bit. I I was someone who as I said was brought up in a single parent home. And so I had daddy issues or I so I thought because I I mean I was always jealous of, you know, persons with their dads or their full families and you know, I struggled with it. Mm-hmm. And so when you get older and you get into relationship 
you know, you have difficulties, challenges, because you really don't know how to navigate relationships. So I started like a, a spiritual journey at the age of about 22-ish, 23-ish. When I was involved in a, in a relationship and it ended and I, I don't want to say I was devastated, but I was, I, I, I was struggling to find out, you know, how to navigate this relationship world. And so I decided to do more of self. Mm -hmm. Getting to love myself because you know in those days back in when you're 22, 23, you blame yourself for everything. You don't really know, you know. So everything is, is you know, is your fault because that's what you are you are brought up to understand. You know, it's always the woman's fault for whatever mm -hmm. reason at the time. So I, I, I went to about ten different churches, and I eventually ended up at Temple of Light, where I met the most peaceful. I was attracted to her peace, Emma Lumsden. And I stopped at that church and I was at that church for many, many, many over 20 years. Mm. And I did a lot of classes and really, that's where I really started my spiritual journey because I was, I'm a Methodist by baptism. Right. But I was going to church and sleeping pretty much. Mm -hmm. And I, I didn't, I'm always someone who, because I live my life so full, I always have to have a center. So I wanted some to go somewhere where I found it was meaningful mm -hmm. and where I, I felt like I connected and I found that a temple of light. And after that, fast forward now, being on this journey now for like at that time would have been maybe about 12 years. I was diagnosed with breast cancer at 35, 12, 13 years. I was, I was diagnosed with breast cancer. And so that journey enabled me to mentally be ready because it, that church really teaches you how to live. Mm -hmm. um, that is the essence, you know, to so live spiritually. Mm -hmm. And so I was able, so it's almost as if I was prepared to meet this challenge. And I was diagnosed with breast cancer. And at no point in time did I consider death. Death never came into my mind. But I, I, when I said I became more deliberate about my life, when I was there on, before I went into the operating theater, I prayed about, you know, what God wanted for me. And when I opened my eyes after surgery, I made a deal with God. And I said, God, if you spare my life, I will serve you until I can no longer serve you. Until that day come, until the end. And so I became very deliberate about sharing my life, about sharing my journey with breast cancer, about counseling people, about living a good life. And when I say a good life, good for me. Right. So this is my standard for myself, because for everybody, good is relative. Right. I embarked on a lot of reading. Um, I'm a, a big fan of Oprah. Her Super Soul Sundays opened my... I was, I was never a big reader. And her Super Soul Sundays, and as well as Ilania Van Zandt, opened me to some authors and to some studied people about life and achieving happiness and internal peace. And that set me on a whole nother road to accepting who I was and to accepting people for who they are and just living a life of what I like to call goodness. Mm -hmm. I like, I, I appreciate how I live my life. Mm -hmm. Every day counts. Every minute, every second. 
And so, although persons would look at breast cancer as a challenge, I would say it saved my life because at the time, as a businesswoman, because I was diagnosed in 1999, so I would have been in business about five years. As a businesswoman, you know, new to entrepreneurship, didn't grow up in a business family. My thing was work till I did. You know, you have to work that dollar, that dollar, that dollar, that dollar, leaving work 11, 12 o'clock at night, not saying no to anybody, just pushing, pushing, pushing. And then breast cancer happened and it changed my life completely. Started wow. smelling the roses, started taking vacations. But I mean, whether the, I would make $1 or $10, I'm taking my breaks. So it really, I got a restart. I start over. Mm -hmm. And in that promise to God about living my life purposefully, I began my life of purpose. Mm -hmm. And so pretty much that's, what, that's, that's the road I've been on ever since. Wow. I've seen folks type in the comments, wow, wow, amazing. Maureen says, Marsha says, every day counts. Opal said earlier that inner peace. And I think that's so very important. At any point in your journey, so, um, Alexis says restart and redirect, which is what you did, you know. Um, at any point during that journey, <coughs> cancer, because you yes. did everything, right? You had chemo. You I, had, had, I had to do a partial radical mastectomy of my left breast. Mm -hmm. And I did chemotherapy for four months. And I did radiotherapy, 16 treatments. So I lost all my hair. I remember that. I lost, yes. And I would say the only challenge that I face, and maybe still now to a much lesser extent, because I did not do reconstructive surgery. And that was deliberate because um, they wanted to ensure that I got my treatment first. And then after doing my treatment and everything, my mother, me being an only child, she just couldn't take another surgery. So I delayed it. Fast forward 20 years later, I still have not done it. I'm still open to doing it, but I'm not pressed to do it. But the only challenge I would say to date, because I was single at the time and still I'm single, the challenge I had at the time was how do you tell a potential suitor, not how, when do you tell a potential suitor that there's only one breast? And, you know, you have body image issues. You know, I got married um, in, uh, at age 46. Didn't know that that was an issue for me until after my divorce when I started counseling because I never got counseling for breast cancer. Ah, interesting. And the, truth, and the truth is, you do go through struggles of body image because, you know, society judges you based on your hips and your breasts and your lips and your feminine, quote-unquote, features. Mm -hmm. And so I kind of pushed through, not knowing that I was... It was a, you know, it had my self-esteem somewhat mm -hmm. and so after i went counseling that was when i realized that you know you get married maybe for the wrong reasons you want to you know still feel as if you're needed or you're wanted and you kind of run into stuff without doing all the checks mm -hmm. and balances mm -hmm. and so what would maybe normally not be something that I overlook. I overlooked it because I felt less than. Right. And I had to come to grips with that and accept that. But then I had to um, pivot in my own life to know that this is my new norm. Mm. One of my most, I would say, debilitating moments was when I realized that um, because I... I had insurance 
and I missed because of a busy period my premium and I and it the, the policy lapsed and I realized that I couldn't get it back because I was no longer normal oh my god normal it devastated me I took to bed I bawled for about a week because when I realized that I was now living and not, there's nothing I could do about it to change it. I, 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 there's nothing physically. I couldn't take an exam. I couldn't do anything to regain that insurance because I was now a cancer survivor. It devastated me to know that I was no longer considered normal. Yes. My and after that, I mean, my girlfriend tried everything because, as I say, I was devastated. My girlfriend went to the company, see what she could do. Nothing could be done. You know, in, I, I suppose she really just wanted me to feel better, but nothing could have been done. The things but we then, take for granted, right? The things we take for granted. And that was the changing point in my life to say, well, this is my new norm. I have mm -hmm. to accept it. Just go forward with what you have and accept it. And wow. just be happy with it. Because wow. there's nothing I can do. Absolutely nothing. Not Alicia says that's Absolutely an eye-opener and a half. That's yes. an eye -opener. Yeah, without a doubt. My goodness. And so having had that happen then, Sandra, um, after you had your treatment and everything, what scares did you have after that? Any? Um, in the, t in the, 20 the truth is, and I'm, I'm sure every cancer, cancer survivor has this challenge. Once you have had cancer, you have to do your checks every year. You have to be mentally ready for your checks every year. Because the truth is, if you go and the news is bad, then it's very bad because it's a recurrence. So, it's a, you, so you have to be mentally ready to go and do your tests every year. So sometimes I miss it. Sometimes I say not this year. Oh my God. Sometimes I'm not ready. Or if something is coming up that is important to me, I put it off until that's done. Wow. And then I go and do my tests quietly. Because sometimes, you know, when you carry, if you carry people with you, the tension is a little bit more than if you go by yourself. And so, and it, I, I would have thought it would get better as the days the, days, the years go on. But it's a human, it's a human element. It's yeah. Mentally, you have to prepare yourself, you know, for whatever. And so that's why I live my life on purpose. Every day, every minute, every second. Because in a minute, my life can change. Um, Cheryl just had a question and I missed it and I'm so afraid to touch his phone. Oh my gosh. Oh, <laughs> hold on, you know me already? Oh Lord, I don't want to see. Cheryl says, and, and folks, throw your questions in. This is all about engagement and learning, right? So Cheryl wants to know, how do you remain in the moment, Sandra, and be present at all times? You know, like, how do yes. you continue like this? Okay, it's, 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 it's a choice. So you deliberately make a choice. Every morning I get up, I make a choice to be happy. That's not to say that I don't have issues, but I don't stay in it. I cry. I call my girlfriends. We deliberate on it if necessary. I call you and Carol my prayer warriors. And I go through that spiritual healing. And I do, I, I read passages. I do um, meditation. I also read a lot of affirmations. 
And I do have something that I read from Elania Van Zandt in her book. Um, I think, uh, what's, what's the name of it again? Uh, okay. Something about we pray. Oh, when we until, pray, we, uh, until we pray, I think. On his, right. Yeah. There is a passage in there about surrendering. Mm -hmm. And when I have done all that I can possibly do physically, mentally, I say, you know, Lord, over to you. So it's a choice. Excuse me. <coughs> Sorry. It's a choice. It's a choice to live happily. Mm -hmm. I also select my friends. Mm -hmm. I also choose what I discuss. I also choose where I go. If if I the type of work that I do, it's a choice. I do nothing that makes me unhappy. Not even watching a movie that makes me tense. Mm -hmm. Anything that makes me uncomfortable, I do not engage in it. Mm -hmm. I also do not judge people anymore. That was my past, Sandra. I have learned through reading to accept people where they are. It's not easy. Mm -hmm. Forgiveness is a major part. When I, when I went to, that was, if, if nothing else, Temple of Light taught me, I've been going to church all my life because my mother sent me to church even when she wasn't going. Mm -hmm. But I never got until I went to Temple of Light that was that forgiveness was for myself. Forgiveness of others is for me because I am the one going through the pain. Mm -hmm. And then when you really reflect, you are the one going through the pain. They are gone about their business, happy as a lark, and you are still suffering. Mm -hmm. When I discovered that forgiveness was for me, that was an aha moment, also acceptance of other persons mm -hmm. not being judgmental mm -hmm. and in my growth also i realized that persons are not like me persons are from different backgrounds different experiences different likes and dislikes and that's why we choose our friends yeah. our friends are similar to us we have the same likes and dislikes we probably have the same spirituality, the same kind of background. Background, I find, is one of those things that you can never discount. Background mm -hmm. comes out whether it's deliberate or not. Or not. Yeah, and your value yes. system. The your value system, system is yeah. extremely important. Fact. Fact. Yes. Comments have been so that's, how, so that's how I keep and I go to church regularly. I do I go to Universal Center of Peace now because I find it to be um as I got older I was kind of seeking more Bible based truth. I mean I still go to Temple of Light from time to time, but I, I really deal a lot with the scripture and it's still the same basic teaching of how to live and what your participation in life means because everything that happens to you is because of you in spite of you. Mm -hmm. So you have to be careful about your thoughts, yes. what you say about yourself, how you use the I am, mm -hmm. I am what, right? Be careful of what you place on yourself Wait, and I'm very deliberate about those things very deliberate yes um a question um well the comments are coming in marcia says what wisdom um cheryl wants to know don't let me lost this thing i don't want to cut off um how do you describe the internal peace that you experience that's one question for you How do I describe it? <clears throat> it's a quietness 
and an understanding of what you want to achieve in this life, what you want to accomplish during your dash, in my case, from 1964 until. So that understanding and acceptance of self and what I bring to my life is the peace that I enjoy. Because even when I make a misstep, I don't want to say a mistake, a misstep in the sense that I try to push ahead of God. I, I like to... I've made many mistakes because I was pushing at Sandra. I was impatient. I was going from a place of, I thought it was passion, but sometimes it's ego. Many times it's ego. You have to be able to call yourself out. You have to be able to call yourself out and and listen to your friends. They know you best and things that you probably don't see in yourself because of ego, because ego is a very strong part of us. You have to listen. You have to listen. If more than one person say it, person who you love and trust, then you have to pay attention. But it's a, it's a calm that even when bad things are happening, and use your experience as well. Use your experience to know that, okay, I've been here 56 years. All that I used to stress myself about and worry, that always work out in one way or another, perhaps not in your time. Right, because we have a time for what we want, think how we want things to happen, but it doesn't necessarily happen in our time. And you have to learn patience. Mm -hmm. If you trust God, as I do, because I, what I didn't say about my diagnosis is that I could have not been here because I had found my lump when I went and I did my mammogram. He said, you're good to go. See no lump. See no, excuse me. See no mass, nothing. You're free to go. But where the mass was, was in the chest wall of my, it wasn't in my breast per se. So where I found the lump, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> He said to me, when I got up off the table, he said, you're free to go. Everything is fine. He said to me, why you look like that? I don't like how your face look. And I said to him, Doc, that, that thickness, because it was a thickness more over long. <clears throat> I didn't feel it before, because I have a habit of resting my hand on my chest when I'm like watching a movie. It's something comforting. You know, everybody has something comforting to do. And when I called my girlfriend and she said, go and have it checked. And when I did the mammogram, because, you know, the mammogram compresses the fatty part of your breast. Right. This was in 12 o'clock position in my chest wall. So if I wasn't aware and in tune with my body, it would have been missed. So I took that to mean I am here for a reason. I'm here for a purpose and because I, he didn't have to say to me why you look like that, why your face look like that because I was, I was certain that something was there and he followed up with a ultrasound and then a needle biopsy which proved that it was cancerous. So I don't take me being here for granted at all. So I don't waste time. 
with waste people. I don't waste time with foolishness yep. like gossip and sauce and anything that makes me feel bad about myself. People who want to tear me down, that's on you. Cool. I know who I am and I spend the time with who I want to spend the time with. What are and some I of forgive the myself? I forgive myself when I feel less than. Because I am human. Right. Yes. What are some of the things that you would say you identified that you chose to let go? You know, like you say, you don't deal with wasting time, you know, hanging out. Unforgiveness. On, oh my God, unforgiveness was my biggest challenge. Because I always thought it was about the other person. I'm not going to forgive it because you don't deserve it. If you don't, but I deserve it. Right. I deserve not to be in pain. I deserve not to be in stress. Mm. I deserve it. Right. And until I understood that, but that for sure, mm. being deliberate about taking a break. As a business person, you can get caught up. Mm -hmm. in earning money can't pay the bills can't pay your staff always work out you know somehow it always work out mm -hmm. take a break if it's even one day if it's even one day take a break regroup come again mm -hmm. as i said before who you surround yourself with is very important mm -hmm. can't say it enough i am deliberate about who I spend my time with. Exercising, very important. Mm -hmm. Health. Eating, I won't say I'm perfect in that department. <laughs> I still like my comfort food. I know. <laughs> but, you know, that those are some of the things that I find important. I like nice things. I like clothes. I like shoes. I like traveling. I like going to the beach. I, I love Jamaica. I love Jamaica. I think it's the best place in the world. Having traveled, because I was a flight attendant for 10 years, and I, I, I've, I've traveled quite a bit, and there's nowhere, and it's not because I'm Jamaican. But if you want sea, you get sea. If you want country, you get country. If you want city, you get city. If you want mountains, you have mountains. If you want uptown, you want you get uptown. If you want downtown, you can get downtown. If you want fashion, art, music, I mean, you name it. The people are so colorful. I mean, you just want to have you have a bad day, just go on um your WhatsApp with all these little memes. I mean, we're we're hilarious. Yes, true. True. My wish for everybody in Jamaica is to have the ability to travel so that they can compare what we have, not what people are telling them, or the snippets of what they see, only the good parts of foreign overseas abroad, but the different, unique qualities about Jamaica and appreciate it. Because mm -hmm. we are such a fabulous, and I mean, even when we're bad, yeah, we're, we're bad, good. good. You know <laughs> what I mean? Because yes. we are, we're, we're a passionate people. Yes. And so, it, it, I mean, when you, when you, when you, when you look at the landscape of Jamaica versus other people, we're such a colorful people. Mm -hmm. You know, in general, from mm -hmm. the lowest to the highest. And in between, so you spoke about between. you just spoke about. Um, we're gonna we're gonna talk about pivoting now because you just spoke about. So this first part, you have spoken about your journey, your journey with Marcia. Say we extra bad. She's you know, <laughs> um, you know, we spoke about your cancer discovery, the importance of unforgiveness, how you remain God centered and your intention for living a life on purpose and a life that is full of passion and joy. Um, another part of you that you have not spoken about yet, but we're going to have to squeeze it in, is about your quest 
for boys and men in Jamaica and how you give back to boys in Jamaica how you're teaching the skills of barbering and all of the philanthropic side but before you get there you're going to have to tell us quickly about you know you spoke about traveling and that you were a flight attendant for 10 years but that changed and we want to hear from you where did you get that entrepreneurial spirit when that door closed how did you get into this unique niche why this niche how this business and we know instagram stay about it also let's go they're cutting us off after an hour so we're going to get right. so talk all about right. so quick all right so so with at was at Air jamaica you know it was taken over by um but short um and then there came a period of layoffs so what from that started as I, i started thinking out because it's not a it's not a if it was a way right so just you heard to talk about you know the possibility of be, being closed or persons being laid off because of age and whatever whatever now i was always i don't know where it come from i think maybe my dad to some extent because he was always trying stuff <laughs> i was always entrepreneurial always either singing at something for money where we had a group at school i was all, i mean my mother's favorite word was no so i would use my lunch money and buy pound cloth and so be on a clothes for go out and stuff like that i was always very a hands on kind of girl um a very very forward thinking i made a decision from very early well i i sh- i should say you know oprah have a thing where she said that you know how she knew she was going to be different was her grandmother was hanging up some clothes on the line and she said come baby let me show you how this is done because you'll have to learn and she said she knew from then that that would not have been her life journey well i have a similar story in that <clears throat> My mother was the sweetest thing on two foot. Right? Very easy, very soft, very you know, happy go lucky, very non-imposing and hard worker. My mother got up at 4 o'clock every morning and cooked full breakfast before she got to work over Spanish Town and I lived in Kingston from as 5. And one day I saw her putting a knot in the side of her panty. And I said that will never be me, you know. No. Mm-hmm. Allergic to poverty. <laughs> and I, I took a decision. I took a decision. <laughs> I was allergic to poverty. Let my skin wheel up. Bump up. Bad bad. <laughs> I said I'm not going to be not in any panty. And the truth is, she did that because she gave me everything. I never did without. I was never hungry. I I was in everything at school, choir, hockey, athletics team and the only thing i didn't do was netball and swimming and she ensured that i had a full experience and so i decided very early that poverty was not my role didn't like didn't like school to be honest but i was i was always good with my hands i used to cut the boys hair not thinking anything of it at the time with scissors in my neighborhood And so fast forward I always from I was in high from my first flight I looked at the ladies and I said boy those ladies are gorgeous I want to be a flight attendant and it, at that time was Chordes and yes. I had a and why I said earlier about being very deliberate and be careful with your self talk at age 12 cuz I got the trip when I passed my common entrance I have I found a composition that I did at at school at primary school where I said I want to be a stewardess. Hmm. And so fast forward and this is important that I tell you this because many people dreams get killed based on who they discuss their plans with. I said it to somebody I don't even remember who it was. I said you no know, I'm going to I want to I want to be a flight attendant. And person said no sir only brown people people from uptown Never hire. You have to know somebody, you know. Yeah, man. I have to need language. You have to have a second language. I'm gonna say, true, true. Oh boy. 
Just and about every try, mm. and something in the back of my head. Uh, no, it wasn't something. A friend of my aunt's, he always told me, you're special and you can do anything that you want to do in this life. And I took it to heart. And I did not, Marsha and I did not apply for flight tender when I left school. I applied for customer service. That was 1982. And I applied for customer service because in my mind, who wants me getting in there? Me most find a way to switch over. That was my thought. That was Good. my self thought. Right? Mm -hmm. And I sent in my application. That was 1982. I got a call in 1986. Oh my God. I was in another job. And Anne Marie Chin called me and said, This is Anne Marie Chin from Air Jamaica calling. Um, can I speak to Sandra Samuels? She said, Speaking. She said, um, we have some positions here for flight attendant. I noticed that you uh, you applied for customer service, but we have some openings now for flight attendant. Would you be interested? And I said, who is this? Come off my phone. Why is who just running a joke on me? She said, I'm Miss Samuels. My name is Anne Marie Chin. I'm calling from Air Jamaica. Are you interested? I said, huh? I said, of course. She said, can you come in for an interview? And the rest is history. So I'm just saying, if I didn't have a ticket, yes. I wouldn't have a chance because they did not send out application. I, I didn't send in an application at that time. I was in file 13. Wow. And they picked me out of five, file 13. God, and God, so God, I prepared God, that, God, I prepared God, that God. interview like nothing else in my life. Wow. Enjoyed it to the max. Then Air Jamaica, 10 years, well, nine and a half years later, there came the change. And I started, before that, I saw the change. And I had totally meal on paper for two years. Really? Yes. I had it on, and I never had the chance, the time to start. And the reason why I thought about men, because myself and my girlfriend lived together. We had a side hustle. She had, she had a side hustle of selling, selling to females because we had the opportunity to travel, so we could, you know, buy clothes in um, LA and Miami and New York. So I, I didn't want to compete with her because I'm not that type. I'm not a, com I'm not a competitor. That's so I'm not competing with her in the household. So I decided to sell to their spouses. That's how I got into men's clothing. So when I started business, it was really about selling clothing. And then when I did my feasibility, feasibility study, just before I started, people were saying that men don't shop every day, men don't buy clothes every day, you know. So I said, you know, I looked around the landscape and I said, what do men do every day? Them go, Baba. Mm -hmm. them, them cut them here. And then, you know, I had some friends that wanted to do their nails, but they had to be doing their nails and stuff, you know, where females did their nails. And unisex places mostly, right? I'm not bashing. Right. I'm just saying it's really a place where women go and men catch. Right. In a nutshell. So I said, you know what? In order to get these men into my place, I need to do some hair cutting and some nails and something so that they can. And it was as simple as that. Just one, two, three. Everybody told me, oh, no, not everybody. But you had some naysayers. Don't no, stop. Only homosexuals do those things. Or nobody's going to come to that because it's girly thing. And that's why you have to be confident about what you set out to do. I felt it in my gut Amen. that this was what I had to do. And now in, so in, joint, in, so in starting that business, I never know a thing about services. Ball morning, ball noon, ball night, ball middle day, ball lunch, ball brunch. Because... <laughs> Staff turn up today, them don't turn up tomorrow. Can't help myself. The person that I started with really wasn't, that wasn't her mainstay. You know, that wasn't her sweet spot. She, her focus was elsewhere. And my neighbor came over to me one day and she said, you know, bright girl, why you not gonna learn? And I was like, huh? The dust lifted. And I went and I did the Manipedi course and then I did the 
massage course and then I did the facial course and the rest is history. And, the and then once I got into that now, and then the barbering, I there was no school at the time, so I had to hire a barber to teach me. Wow. And so long story short, by the time you start doing that now, you start being seen as a specialist in your area. <laughs> and so requests came in to do you know, talks and grooming about men. And then the women, you know, were there, you know, wanting to know, you know, what to do with their boys. And so I started to do grooming in general. And then, well, I always, from, from my, my first paycheck, because my girlfriend's mom was the house mother at um, Glen Hope Place of Safety, Cassida's mom. So I was into that from, you know, from day one. I've always been the one to give back because my mother is a giver. Yes. And so I start, when I started focusing on men now, I started to focus on boys because I truly believe, and I say this from every part of my body, if we get our males right, Jamaica will be a place to be reckoned with. It already mm -hmm. is. But I think men in general, because of the lack of fathering or parenting, they do not, they are unaware of their value. Mm. We women have caught up because there was an, a, a direct effort with, you know, women's lib and all of that. There's no men's lib because we assume that men have it. Mm. Earning is not the same as living. It's a Ooh. totally different concept. Right? Men earn. But how do they live? Who taught them how to live? Who taught them about relationships? Who taught them about valuing themselves? The few that, the few that are out there that were lucky enough to be mentored because what a lot of us women don't understand is that we're requiring from some of these men something that many of them are not equipped to give <laughs> love and care they can earn mega bucks but can they care or love and then we buy into it many of persons that I've spoken to, males, they complain bitterly that they feel like sometimes a paycheck or a credit card or they feel like the, their, their significant other only speaks to them when they have to speak to them about the children or the bills. But a part of the problem is that they sold themselves that way. Not recognizing that's how they presented themselves. And as I always say, because I learned it, we, te we, we teach people we how treat to treat us. Mm -hmm. And that goes for men and women. We teach people how to treat us. So if you want a different result, you have to present yourself a particular way as man or as woman. Right. And so... This notion that it's a man's world, we don't even understand that many of the men out there suffer from low self-esteem. Self they are not self-assured. And so they make up a lot for it with being brash or pretending to be tough or being... Uh, they don't open themselves to feel because they're, they're really deathly afraid of being hurt. <laughs> that is the truth. And so many engage in multiple relationships because what they don't get in one, they search for it in the other, not understanding that they have to love themselves first. <laughs> what they're searching for is not out there. It is within. <laughs> And I see that daily men have cried in my chair. We sing happy birthday and men cry because mm -hmm. some say the first. 
And so we have to rethink the family setting mm -hmm. and how we treat our men. Because sometimes it's a facade what they put up. So we start them from little bit, one year. We teach them and we tell them that they're princes. We make them know that we value them. We treat them. Certificates. Certificates. We, get, we give them their first certificates for their first haircut because it's um it's 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 a uh, it's becoming, you know. Yeah. When you get your first haircut, you're 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 evolving. A rite of right? passage. Rite of passage. Yeah. You celebrate them. You know when they when they pass their exams, we make a big deal. We make sure we compliment them. We 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 celebrate them. Mm -hmm. as they should be if they're doing good they're to be celebrated mm -hmm. but i don't think we really understand because we don't we think they have it covered mm -hmm. similar way how uh we as independent women are treated as if we have everything covered we don't we still need that support from a strong man you know and I, I like, to, I, 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 I must say that because many times we are misunderstood as not needing anything from anyone. And that's the furthest thing from the truth because as women trying to achieve and pushing, we need that strong support beside us, behind us, in front of us sometimes. Sometimes we need a soft support soft space to fall. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we don't want to be strong. Sometimes we want to feel weak. We want to be girly. But sometimes <laughs> we can't afford to be girly True. because we have, not, we, are not, we have not been given the opportunity to be girly. Right, right. You know? And so sometimes we get accused of being tough and manly or mannish or doing too much. But if you have a goal in life, you can't dumb down and wait until you catch up. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I believe we have to take them with us. We have to fight for them just like how we fight for ourselves. But they have to know that they are valued. They have to know that and step into that space. Mm -hmm. Once they value themselves, then they will become the men that we need them to be. I feel so, very strongly about that. So I think this is a- And so it starts with the grooming. It starts with the grooming and mm -hmm. building of the self-esteem mm -hmm. from their knee high. And that's why I believe also that, that coming to the barber with your son and having that moment that bonding is also very important. I think men don't father their children because they don't understand the importance of what they give to their children. Sandra, you yeah. have you have had some phenomenal programs. I'm going to tell everybody about them. That on a on a Monday night, Sandra hosts on her Facebook page um, a, a boss lady live. And the kind of speakers that Sandra has had over the last several weeks, it will revolutionize your thinking. Um, she has had those who have counseled about the impact of the fatherlessness in our society, the impact of the positivity that comes along with fathers who are truly present in the lives of children or male figures who are real mentors, and how the society is being broken down because of that lack of positive male figure association. So a big part of her heart has been coming out in her program. She has had the psychologists on that have spoken about narcissism and how much that has eroded so many persons, their lives and their life's journey. And I implore you, tomorrow she's going to be talking about um, the impact of... Parent, parenting, parenting, parenting through oh separation and divorce. It's going to cut off on us. 
How did this happen? We're going to bring Sandra back as a guest. We love you. They said you're inspiring. Instagram is going to put us off. We have to have a part two, obviously, guys. No problem at all. No problem. Give her some love. Drop some hearts in. Give a round of applause. And we're going to have to do a part two. Give me your direct messages after.